Итак, коллеги. So, colleagues, good morning. In my capacity as a moderator of this uh, session, I would like to declare it open. And so, please take your seats uh, and uh, slightly reduce the amount of decibels in the room so that everybody could hear that what we're talking about. So, look. As it seems to me, at least taking into account this is not the first session, uh, we are facing not a very simple task because I asked the panelists and I am asking them yet again that I will try not only to observe the timing but also bearing in mind the fact that many of you are not here for the first time and uh, most of us are not for the first time on the panel, we will try and draw our attention not to what is uh, going forward and what is not going forward in our relationship with China in the economy, but also pay attention to what happened during the past two years, you know, for better or for worse, and what is that we can expect and what way we may resolve certain problems. And once again, I would ask the participants, if you are seeing certain difficulties, just uh, don't hesitate to describe them in details, but at the same time, trying to stick to 10-minute time, because we've got 10 minutes for each panelist to speak. Similarly, I will do my best to diverse our presentations with my questions and um, asking for specifics, uh, basically, you know, aiming at the kind of topics that uh, we are debating, trying to give us more details about the current progress and the expectations. So if all of a sudden you forget to touch upon those, don't um, doubt it, I will remind you. And also, if it may happen towards the very end, I will make sure that the audience gets the chance to ask a couple of questions. So also bear this in mind. And so right now, I would like to propose for to Mr. Gruzdiv Alexei to start our presentations. Please remember, 10 minutes. And so you're welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you my feelings and my impressions of uh, what is happening within the bilateral track in interaction between China and Russia. Indeed, the topic was uh, well formulated, new points of growth, because it's uh, high time for us to analyze what uh, has happened during the past few years and what we are to do in order to indeed utilize these new points of growth which are supposed to bring in new quality now. So what happened is the moderator raised the question during the past few years. In my mind, very diverse events have been taking place. On the one hand, 2015 to us was a very sensitive and extremely disappointing year from the point of view of uh, economic performance uh, in the trade economic relations between our two countries under the influence of the well-known factors, and I'm not going to enumerate them, you're all aware of them, we have registered a very dramatic decline in our bilateral trade by almost 30 percent, and uh, we were realizing that uh, one has to undertake certain efforts because the traditional model of our relations uh, as the traditional model of development gradually started exhausting itself, and so one had to look for new drivers. I cannot say that they are already found because this is quite an extensive process, but nevertheless, all of the currently existing mechanisms were put to use. Uh, I mean, the ones that we find at the government level, intergovernment dialogue, intensification took place in our interaction because you are familiar, because if we are talking about the institutional thing, because the already today there are five intergovernmental commissions between China and Russia, which are covering almost all of the agenda for the trade and economic relations, because quite recently there uh, has been a uh, commission set up uh, which is dealing with uh, the uh, cooperation in the Far East and in the Northeast of China, and my colleague will tell us more about it. Now, what happened in 2016? A certain turnaround. I wouldn't describe it uh, being a breakthrough, but this turnaround took place towards the end of the fourth quarter because uh, trade uh, has stabilized, and uh, based on the end of the year, we were able to register 4% growth. Now, quality changes. What are we registering? The share of the high-tech machine technical products and the Russian exports is growing. This is indeed something that we've been talking about for years, stating that, unfortunately, we were not able to break out of this 1% uh, boundary, uh, but certain changes um, have manifested themselves. Now, in the agriculture, a lot is being spoken about here during the past year, believing this uh, to be a new driver for the development of the trading economic relations. Indeed, we've registered growth based on the results of last year um, by 17%. The share of uh, the uh, agricultural product out of Russia already at about 6% level in the Russian exports. There are certain good uh, you know, things to look for. Innovations came one of the vital topics 
a lot is currently being discussed about it, and the dialogue has uh, strengthened the high-tech cooperation technology transfer. Um, we are increasingly uh, often talking about the industrial cooperation is another, I think, stimulus for the development of the new quality in re relations between China and Russia. And uh, moreover, uh, there comes an awareness of uh, the fact that we are not supposed to talk only about the trade between our two countries, but by bearing in mind the competences that we have achieved both in the Russian industry as well as the Chinese industry, we ought to think about uh, us having to uh, develop the third country markets together using each other's competitive advantages because we're talking about the strategic kind of relationship and about a comprehensive partnership. That is where I uh, see one of its uh, very specific features when in a very concerted way we can act together in developing third country markets and uh, whenever, you know, if we're speaking about investments, whenever we set up joint ventures, uh, we ought to specifically look not only at the Chinese and the Russian markets as the prospective sales markets, but think in a broader way, and I believe this is exactly vital uh, in relationship to bringing investments to the Far East, considering the uh, current uh, con limited consumption market in the Far East and Federal District itself. And uh, I would like to identify several points uh, with respect to what I believe is holding back the development of our cooperation or a transition to a new quality in this cooperation, as I already mentioned, because I think that we ought to change slightly the model of our interaction. The first thing is diverse trends globally. Uh, if you might agree with me, during the recent years uh, in the development of trade, there is a prevalent trend in the world, not for liberalization, but protectionism in trade. Uh, <coughs> the uh, um, uh, attempt to protect the old uh, national markets against uh, the unfavorable global environment, uh, while we and China, as is uh, known, uh, and Chairman Xi Jinping also declares uh, the uh, um, drive towards a greater sensible rational liberalization and Russian Federation, being an active member of the Eurasian Economic Union, also pursues uh, a, an active international activity from the point of view of um, you know, forming new markets and liberalization in the flow of goods and uh, entering into preferential trade con contracts and agreements. So our approaches are the same. So the initiatives which uh, have been declared during the past uh, few years, One Belt, One Way, which is being declared as one of the principles of the mutual accessibility between the markets, uh, their interrelationship in the infrastructure and the establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union, one purpose for which is developing common markets in different uh, industrial and uh, public sectors, the initiatives by the two presidents uh, to dovetail the concept of the uh, economic project of uh, the Silk Route uh, and the construction of the Eurasian Economic Union. The agreement which was signed not long ago about the trade economic cooperation between the Union and China and the recent initiatives which uh, have been announced by the President of Russia on a comprehensive Eurasian partnership with the participation of the Chinese People's Republic and, and uh, the uh, participant countries uh, of um, ASEAN and the Shanghai Organization for Cooperation, because I believe that all of these initiatives are called upon now, under the uh, uh, overwhelming protectionist trend to create the kind of lagoons for the flow of goods and uh, to grow trading relationship between the countries participating in this initiative. It is certainly necessary for us to broaden our custom uh, cooperation because I believe this is the main challenge against uh, the um, growing trade and the kind of challenges that uh, we as businesses are facing. That is the simplification of the custom administration, the customs procedures by applying the state-of-the-art technologies uh, when clearing the goods and uh, shortening the period of time this is necessary for that to uh, uh, broaden uh, the uh, product coverage uh, when acknowledging the mutual results uh, of the customs control, which would uh, make our uh, supplies uh, more effective, as well as the development of the cross-border infrastructure. Um, and uh, here I mean, in the first place, uh, the points of entry, because we have to acknowledge that the number is not uh, yet sufficient, and the throughput capacity also requires a certain um, availability of modern equipment. So the development of the transportation infrastructure here, I mean, uh, the uh, development of the new transportation corridors with a maximum utilization of the Russian transit potential for the purpose of um, achieving effective uh, movement of goods from Asia to Europe through the Russian Federation. 
And amongst other things, I believe that we need to study the experience uh, that others are demonstrating, which is the container railroad shipments uh, that China is developing. And there's no secret that this program is being subsidized by local authorities and the central government um, since this uh, being, is an experimental project uh, for now. But um, uh, there is still a problem in loading up this container um, cargo trains when they are moving in the reverse uh, destination from Europe to China. And here, I believe that we could use this potential by putting together a network of transportation logistical centers, um, um, which uh, definitely may be something that uh, could uh, be helping the uh, better movement of good uh, and uh, provide for a quick and economic economical development of such uh, products through China. And so development of Vladivostok as a transit point not only for the shipments to Europe, but also uh, for shipments from China into other um, Asia-Pacific countries. The uh, Northern uh, Sea Route, together with the Chinese partners, we're actively debating the possibility of joint cooperation in the Arctic. This uh, is both uh, about the transportation possibilities, shortening the lag of uh, the uh, distance into Europe, also development of the natural resources, development of the port infrastructure, scientific resources, Research, then eliminating barriers in the mutual trade. And here I would like to share uh, with you, um, uh, we have an experience, in, I mean, in the person of the Ministry of Economic Development and the Ministry of Commerce of China recently have come up, come out with a joint initiative having agreed to set up a mechanism for identification and elimination of mutual barriers and uh, restrictions in the trade, economic, and investment uh, area. Because it's about time to openly talk about what is in the way for the investments and goods to flow, what is uh, an obstacle here, and by using the intergovernmental mechanism to develop an effective and efficient uh, solutions to uh, do away with such barriers already at the first stage we have identified, and we have exchanged the list of such barriers with each other. These are the areas of finance, insurance, uh, tourism, taxation, customs, legislation, and a whole number of other areas. And by the way, um, you mentioned the problems uh, th th that are worth talking more about, and so also the problems of uh, market entry. Speaking about uh, Russian interest, this is the uh, entry into the agricultural and agro-product markets, the uh, issues of uh, falsification, counterfeiting, then the uh, um, uh, trademark violations and so on. We are very much inclined to uh, go into this open dialogue. Development of the financial services, yet another driver behind the possibility to develop this cooperation. And it is uh, important here not only to uh, develop the interbanking cooperation and create new effective instruments that the businesses could use, but also the issues of insurance then settlement in the national currencies, uh, the clearing housing. And uh, you know that the clearing uh, house recently was set up in Russia. The Bank of Russia opened its first international foreign branch in China. Well, of course, uh, one can uh, run the list uh, about various priority areas uh, for quite some time, because I believe that the big future is in the small and medium-sized businesses because we need to feed our companies into the production chains of uh, major corporates in the added value chains, telecoms, IT, education, tourism, interregional cooperation. All of these represent the kind of future that um, uh, could saturate and diverse our trade economic cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexei Vladimirovich. I would say there is a well-known Russian saying, you are, you know, putting in a very soft bedding. It doesn't mean that uh, the sleep is going to be sound. But yesterday we heard the Habarovsky uh, Krai uh, governor uh, who uh, was talking about the broad list of uh, cooperation projects, innovation, industry, many good plans. But out of the plans that she uh, sounded in terms of what the Nzamikas were having, it's agriculture, raw materials, and tourism. But there's a big problem with the infrastructure on our side. You know, We are not able to build uh, uh, cross-border points uh, um, on the Chinese side, no problem. On on the other side, there is a problem, and so they're not able to resolve it at the government level, and they cannot bring any private uh, participants. And you described a very good project in terms of the goods exchange. N not a lot depends upon us because we are really funneling there as much as we can. Our internal market has declined. We take as much as we can. It's 4 percent. There's phenomenal growth in imports last year, in the second half of the year. It really you know, demonstrated itself throughout the whole spectrum of products, and investment growth was throughout the whole year. But what truly is taking place there is there in this list that we have exchanged, what, for example, deters us from moving over to a more intense investment cooperation in the very same innovations, in the very same industrial non-raw material production? Is there something that the Ch Chinese side has stated and that we're ready to eliminate? Maybe in, in the structure? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. 
I uh, should correct you slightly because I was not talking about what we're having, but what we're lacking and um, identifying these various areas is where we're going to apply efforts. The trade turnover, uh, like I said, 4%, it was last year, this year, the growth uh, in Q1 is almost 40%. So there is a bit of a factor of uh, the energy price recovery, but others as well are at play. So as far as Zabekarsk district is concerned, agriculture, yes, but uh, um, when other people spoke, they didn't mention one of the projects which is called upon to turn the situation around in a qualitative way. New grain corridor, so-called, which is being implemented in the Zabekarsk district. This is the kind of initiative which has been supported by the Chinese side, setting up a network of elevators in the territory of Russia. Uh, the first pilot one is going to be in Zabelkarsk to process the products and subsequently to ship it to China. So this is a slightly different kind of a quality in our interaction. Well, all right, in the food, the food industry, yeah. So investment cooperation, what is holding us back? You know, it's a paradox, really, because it is not as much as an initiative barrier as uh, being uh, held back uh, by the lack of an understanding how one should work in a proper way. A very banal thing. But even in my contacts with our partners and the Russian businessmen, it is something that is continuously being mentioned. How are we to position us properly? You know, paradox. You know, I mean, the Russian market is to understand, the Chinese market is to understand, but nevertheless. So the deterrence is in these specialties of the tax administration. But these are not the kind of specialties that we perceive them, but the, the Chinese, when they don't understand. I mean, the lack of a uh, sufficient legal literacy as applied to the situation in Russia. Uh, very often we hear this uh, statement that Russia is just a country where everything is continuously changing. Yes, it is changing, but for the better. And this is no longer the period of the 90s. Unfortunately, uh, very often the businessmen do not want to know or cannot know, I mean, cannot come into possession of this knowledge because we're, when we're talking about the barriers, we have identified them and then we're going to discuss what are the real barriers. Oh, this could be just a perceived barrier where you have to uh, undertake some certain systemic work in order to regulate it. I mean, the customs barrier, yes, indeed, is very clearly important for very clear rules to be there. Uh, I mean, you have to make sure that they are administered and implemented. There is a very specific deadline for the uh, pro for the shipment to be uh, cleared and so that it is being released specifically within the timing that is legally stated. So a whole number of points when these certificates have to be acknowledged, when there shouldn't be any additional restrictions imposed, when there is uh, some signature lacking or some seal is lacking. So quite often such things, they seem to be very, uh, you know, petty, you know, in terms of the grand cooperation between Russia and China. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of deterrences like this. Now, uh, speaking about the investment, uh, uh, this is the um, preparation of the uh, uh, st feasibility study, because there's a whole intergovernmental commission which was established uh, in investment cooperation between Russia and China. Uh, already 73 projects were selected. I mean, the overall portfolio exceeds 100 billion U.S. And out of the, uh, I would say, uh, the reason a successful implementation of 17 projects is underway. However, I mean, so far we haven't received uh, the kind of a fast track movement that we were wishing to have. And what is here, a set of factors, and I believe a lack of readiness on the part of the Chinese investors to fully participate in the Russian projects, again, because of different reasons. On the one hand, um, there um, has been for quite some time a very comfortable environment of investing into Europe and the United States, where since long they understand the rules of the game and uh, there is quite a big diaspora. There are very marginal markets uh, with a very uh, clear set uh, of uh, profit making and a good understanding of uh, risk and earnings. Russia, in the meantime, in a slightly different uh, position, so we need time to adapt. Then uh, I believe we and our businessmen need to learn to correctly prepare the project to uh, evaluate them and properly position them and pitch them to the Russian investors. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And now I'd like to pass the floor over to Alexander Kruchko, who is Deputy Minister for the Development of the Far East. And I would be appreciative if you could also touch upon the issues as to why, for example, in investment area, uh, the things are not as good. I mean, outside of the uh, uh, resource sector and in the agricultural, you know, that uh, this is also differently natural resource, but slightly differently recovered from uh, the ground. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Well, I basically uh, exactly wanted to start uh, my presentation on that point. Excellent. And based on the kind of experience uh, which uh, we are having in the Far East, when we began by the end of 2013, 2014, it was 
to uh, develop and implement new approaches uh, towards the development of a macro region and development of the Far East, we were confronted by a colossal number of stereotypes existing in uh, the work done by foreign investors and foreign companies in the territory of Russia, and particularly the Far East, as uh, not being very easy and simple in terms of the economic um, uh, region. Now, is it possible to work uh, within such set of stereotypes? Of course not, and to build normal kind of uh, relations with foreign companies. And here I not only mean China, although it particularly applies to China, but also mean Japan and Korea and uh, companies from other countries. Uh, of course, uh, we, we started uh, with investors having given up on these uh, stereotypes, completely uh, given up on them in our work. We started developing this work based upon totally different principles, trying to speak with them the same language. And this language is a universal one in the mind of any investor. This, first of all, is the language of costs, the language of uh, profit making uh, towards the investments which are being invested, and the language of risk. And it's a universal set of notions and uh, uh, for any company. And that really produced fruit. Now, speaking about the Chinese investors and Chinese companies, we understand that these are particularly sophisticated investors and we're competing for Chinese investors not only with our neighbors we are uh, competing against Europe for Chinese investments we are competing with the uh, other regional countries and this is a very tough competition we understand that the Far East to develop the Far East will be impossible with just government sponsorship. There is not so much money available. And to develop this territory is possible only upon the basis of creating global competitive kind of conditions which would enable different investments to come, Russian investment, Chinese investments, investment from other countries as well. And so basically such a transition to different set of rules and principles of, amongst other things, working with the Chinese companies really produced results. For two years now we have these new regimes, these new conditions for the investors to work in the Far East. This is the advanced development territory, the free port of Vladivostok. There's a special mechanism for the infrastructural and financial support for investors. So in aggregation during the past two years, working under this new set of conditions enabled us to bring in 21 new projects with the Chinese capital with the overall amount of investments worth 3 billion US. Now, is it much? Of course not. And so we come from the awareness that these are just the first steps, first results. Moreover, in November, during another meeting between the heads of government, we agreed that our objective within the next two years will be to grow the amount of investment cooperation in the far east of Russia uh, in a joint cooperation up to 15 billion US. And this is absolutely feasible kind of thing to achieve and we already can feel it in terms of the way things are going right now. Now, what are we doing in order to achieve it? Firstly, and most important thing, we work directly with the Chinese companies and Chinese investors. The kind of work which produces results, and I absolutely agree with Alexei Vladimirovich with respect to the issue that we're facing, uh, which is the lack of information amongst our partners about the ways of doing business in Russia and uh, the perception of those. Of course, everybody is waiting that such favorable conditions for investing which are being established will never change longer term. And it is important for our partners to receive such a guarantee in the Far East if we're talking about the advanced development territory as a status, you know, that uh, by law would be in place for 70 years. Free port will exist for 70 years. And this is a very important signal which we are trying to deliver and talk the language of cost, the kind of language which is easily understood by investors. So this direct interaction with investors is taking place in the format of the days of Chinese investors. This is something that uh, we uh, have uh, had two major events dedicated. And so the number of projects um, have doubled in terms of the amount of investments in wars. The very last one took place in March. Additional three billion US dollars came in different projects. I would like to tell you about one case which uh, underscores the uh, correctness of the words mentioned by Alexei Vladimirovich. What does it mean to speak uh, the investor language? We prepared exactly the kind of a proposal which was evaluated 
in a very scrupulous way in terms of the amount of investments, the risks related to the project, variability of uh, earnings based upon different favorable and unfavorable terms and conditions. So essentially, at a very low granularity, we demonstrated the way the project could run in the Far East, and that was building the pulp and paper mill in the Habarovsk region. This is the kind of an industry which, unfortunately, we lost in the Far East during the past 20 years. And so six months uh, it, it took us to negotiate. We received the confirmation from the Chinese investor, and that was uh, Chintong Holding, one of the biggest government-owned corporations, which includes China Paper, which is the biggest producer of um, and the paper products in China. So we received the confirmation that it will invest into the project. Uh, the um, cost of the project is 1.5 billion U.S. Currently, there is a technical stream taking place um, within the project. And this is, I'm talking about the way this work should be organized. In different formats, we are developing institutional cooperation, not only working with investors directly in order to support China's investments, um, amongst other things, on the side of the official Chinese government. Like Alexei mentioned, there is an intergovernmental commission in place to develop the Far East and the Northeast of China. This commission starts its work this year. We also agreed with the Ministry of Commerce of China that we are about to start putting together a comprehensive program of partnership between China and Russia in the Far East, and we will develop it taking into account the uh, sad mistakes of the uh, 918 program and its mistakes. And I believe that within the next uh, month, we'll be able to sign the documents to establish the Center for the Support of China's Investors in the Far East. And this will be a joint structure. On the Chinese side, there will be a reputable founding entity which would also offer guarantees for the business that the Chinese companies will be doing in the Far East. So all of these institutional solutions are either being launched or have already been launched. Now, speaking about the most prospective points in our cooperation in the Far East, I would note the following thing first. In my mind, this is the biggest potential uh, project for the development of the international transportation corridors in the area of Primors. For 20 years, people have been talking about it. Nothing happened. During the past two years, we're witnessing very good dynamics in the number of the Chinese investors who are participating. Now, what's important and most eloquent example of the interaction between the Eurasian Economic Union and the, the uh, uh, project of One Belt, One Way. This is the corridor which connects the northeast of China with the ports of the Primorsk area, enabling one to shorten the lag for the deliveries of the Chinese goods from the northeast uh, from China to the south. Or other countries by about 200 to 400 kilometers, depending upon the point of shipment. And uh, the savings that the Chinese uh, shippers will have will be up to 1 billion US dollars. But the Primorsk ports will receive 40 million additional tons of throughput, which they have never had. And this is a colossal multiplier for the economy of the region. And so having scrupulously evaluated this project, including the profitability of investments in the infrastructure, we offered it to the Chinese partners. And today, in Marx Investment, we have one of the biggest uh, companies in, from China, CCC, which is quite a major Chinese government entity. And a number of other Chinese investors are eager and keen to participate in other projects related to the development of such corridors. We are currently um, having two cross-border uh, industrial project being built, Nizhny Lening Stunzan Bridge, a well-known project, and it will be commissioned next year into uh, operation and Blagovich's a uh, highway road and the bridge. That's about the experience different governors are uh, having. A very interesting experience because I believe this is the first one in my memory, a joint concession agreement with China. The bridge is already being built. You can go and uh, see it with your own eyes. There is a big island of Usurisk that uh, we're going to sign various documents about to jointly develop that territory. Unique geopolitical and cultural joint product project. So these are the points of growth which one finds practically in a, an implementation stage rather than just a conversation. So I believe having given up on the perceptions and stereotypes, you need to learn to speak with investors the common language, and then everything will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Do I understand correctly that we have huge plans, and I like them very much. In practice, we progressed. I write uh, the pulp mill. Is that paper or cellulose? So it's not paper. At least initial processing and the capital-intensive sector of industry and infrastructure. We at least in these sectors we add to the agriculture that is part of the raw material and tourism. There are more some advancements didn't happen. The plans are great, wonderful. I mentioned 21 projects together with China. These are projects are being realized by the, and the largest one is construction of Samurski um, oil refinery and the Chinese investment into the oil processing being realized largest project in Far East, $2 billion worth of investment. There's project of logistics when our Chinese partners built on the border in our territory logistical complex uh, for the import from Russia. And this is good. And we will support such projects. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to give the floor to Suzun Yi, Vice President of China Zhenjiba Group Corporation. Please, you have the world. You have the floor. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, good morning. I've come and I work for the company Kuluba, our vice president of the company. Thank you very much, organizers, for invitation of our cooperation to participate in the current forum, whereby we discuss economical relationships between our countries. Yesterday, I was watching the carry out forum and I saw that both official and non-official individuals and specialists actively participated and discussed. Very heated discussion was of the forum. I also in the business of exploration of the Russian market and being vice president of our company, I'm very glad to have opportunity to participate in our meeting. I'd like to tell you and have conversation with you and take advantage of the current forum. And we applied efforts to develop economical relationships between and collaboration between our countries. A few points I'd like to make. First of all, I'd like to say a few words about our cooperation. This is a state <coughs> enterprise, I mean our cooperation. First of all, I'd like to tell you this. And secondly, I'd like to specify the challenges that we face in view of the initiative One Way, One Belt. The third, I'd like to share with you some experience of our operation in the Russian market and then what way we can develop our operation in Russia. Our corporation Globa was established in the 70s of the last century because of the decision of the State Council. It was one of the largest state enterprises in China. And it was in business of large engineering projects related to the water systems with big volumes of operation. And our cooperation operates within specialization domain around the globe. During 40 years of our development, our company actively formed, has formed foundation for investments and construction, environment protection, and other areas. We have got more than $18 billion of the annual production in our corporation. We have 99 branches and rep offices in more than 100 countries of the world. And we work in more than 50 states and we realize the large projects, including some projects in America. According to Americans' estimate, we're members of the largest 500 companies of the world. According to other ratings, we occupy uh, number 45, number 31. According to data of our Ministry of Commerce of the CPR, 
were one of the top 100 enterprises that in business of the international cooperation. Our corporation is one of the top five corporations acting on the external markets. We also provide financial projects which we realize we sign with many enterprises in different countries with financial corporations. The total amount of $55 billion worth signed by this point of time. Our foreign investment assets, we, we are in especially interested in foreign investments. Especially for this, we established investment corporation to invest abroad. And last year, our corporation became a corporation that includes more than 40,000 people and annual revenue $14 billion. The profit about $7 billion. This year, we, following the governmental policy, we achieved substantial success the progress we achieved. And we participate in several large engineering projects, along with the other large enterprises of China and uh, f other fo foreign enterprises who realize projects in China and Kazakhstan, the pipeline from Kazakhstan to China, and similar projects. Today, the guests in this room also have good understanding of what is happening in the oil industry. We established many enterprises. There are many projects in area of collaboration, and our cooperation is also actively participates there. We explore Far East area. We also want to achieve good results there. Uh, further, I'd like to talk to you about how our cooperation has provided for itself the niche. We carefully monitor the policy of our government and we follow the, the orders of our government. And in such a way, we realize the connection of the Eurasian Committee and one way, one belt. We've seen TNP. Mr. Xi Jinping met with Mr. Putin in China during the forum One Belt, One Way, and both leaders spoke about necessity to support this initiative and um, connect this initiative with initiatives in Russia. Such initiatives cover broad spectrum of uh, initiatives intended for success, and Russia is a strategically important market for us. This year, we want to make our efforts even more active and our cooperation for a long time is in the Russian market. And we believe that our cooperation in the area of the energy and water systems and hydrological projects can contribute greatly and uh, can become a good and reliable partner for the Russian firms, for the Russian neighbors. We would like to help our neighbors to provide the growth of economics in our cooperation already registered, is registered in Russia. The affiliate, our firm in Moscow, is also actively and intensively support policy of our countries. In Russia, market is very broad, but there are so many challenges and risks in the Russian market. Simply speaking, in many areas, the Russian market is much different from uh, Chinese and international markets. That's why the conditions are different, and there are many, many peculiarities that make Russia different from other countries of the world. The ways of operation are also very special. Besides, there are so relevant risks. That's why we have to study well how Chinese enterprises can work in Russia and I would like to perhaps share my experience. First, 
definitely have to find partners in Russia, domestic partners, and conduct domestication and use the potential of the Russian partners and take advantage of the complementary uh, functioning features. We need to adjust to the requirements of the time and consider local specif specifics of the current moment. The previous speakers spoke that um, how attract investors, how to adopt foreign investors to the changing conditions of the Russian market and what way to study legislative framework in Russia and how to adopt. When we started to work in Russia, we believe that um, all business in Russia is done uh, in specific manner, not like it is done in Russia, in China, or America, and other countries. That's why there are many difficulties and many challenges, but I think we are learning this market specifics and uh, do as Romans do. I think that time is passing by, and I think that the Russian market will not be closed eternally. The third point I'd like to make, of course, we support the policy of our countries because Russia is the largest trade partner for China, and we together realize initiative One Belt, One Way, and Russia in this initiative occupies place number one for China. We interact at the high level and want to broaden the scale of our collaboration in the area of industry. Yesterday, people spoke at this forum, and the specialists from Chinese Academy of Science said that there is experience, the Chinese experience of reform, and let's say uh, uh, leading the belt along the Changjiang River. Uh, development of Shenzhen and other three ports of China, we truly believe that uh, the Russian Far East during last years also can be used, uh, can use this experience, and the company will also be in this region searching for opportunities. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. to be interested, how do you find Russian specifics and the Russian climate? What is the difference from Pakistan, where a company actually participates? I see that you don't only build pipelines, but hydropower plants. You have billions of investments in this politically friendly to China neighbor. Why in Russia it's not quite so? Is it easier, more difficult in Russia? What is the specifics? What is the difference between Pakistan and Latin America? Can you do it in a very brief manner? I can use only my personal view and present to you. Pakistan, of course, is the southern partner for China and Russia is in the north. In my personal view, it's a bit difficult to express my feelings. There are no, truly, there are so many specifics. No matter where we come to what companies, what partners we collaborate with, we feel that um, we lack of uh, have shortage of understanding and very peculiar thinking of the partners in Russia. Beca perhaps because Russia is between Europe and Asia, and this is the difference from uh, Europe and Asia. It just you mentioned that in Pakistan we have the largest investments, including hydropower plant and other projects. seems to me that we have long experience in uh, Pakistan, and I think our cooperation in Russia for now 
is only beginner in Russia. We are prayed for three years only uh, because so I believe that in the future we will occupy our proper niche and we'll start partnership exploration of the Russian market. And we will achieve the level of success that we we have the same progress like in Pakistan. It will not take so much time, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. But we will catch up and will be similar to Pakistan's success. So we will see it. This makes us happy. I wish you good luck. And the next speaker, Mr. Kilzi Fares Nikhadovi, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Creon Energy. Thank you very much, Evgeny. Just like last year, instead of previous speaker, I will remember you asking question to the representative of the bank last year, and I responded. I respond with one word, just what Mr. Sin said. Be afraid. They are afraid. Uh, the only answer that I can give to you to your question, why a relationship with Pakistan or Argentina and Ecuador, where they develop relationship, are uh, operational and not operational here. They are afraid. And now take a look where they are not afraid. In the topic of my presentation, I will show you and I'll answer the question what they are afraid of. I'll start from the gas prices and oil prices. If we come to the 14th and 13th year prices and today's prices, we'll see that tendency in terms of oil and gas prices is declining trend. It's not dependent on the policy of Russia nor the policy of China. It depends on supply and demand for these two products. Today, it comes to it leaves the framework of the political dialogue and happens according to the market considerations. And this is why we have such prices today. However, if we look at um, Chinese investments in fuel and energy complex of Russian Federation, we will be able to see what are the largest projects where our Chinese comrades come to. Silo Sibiri, 38 million cubic meters, about 2.9 trillion rubles. Amurski uh, gas refinery, 42 billion cub cubic meters, 53 billion rubles of investments. The project of Rosneft, together with Kim China, this project is assessed as 18, 20 billion dollars for the next 10 years. Amurski plant, together with Sibur, they go, they have negotiations about the location of the project and feasibility study for the Russian Federation territory. I assess it as nine, ten billion dollars worth. Factual participation of Chinese fellows in the Russian economy in Yamal SPG, Yamal LNG, nine to ten percent. The Silkway Fund. 20% of the stock uh, with CNPC. I cannot tell you the value, but as you think, it's quite high. Sibur, 10%. Sinapec, 10% of Silkway Fund. The recent example I cannot use because I don't know the value. There are some in intentions of gas chemical in Volgograd province, gas chemical production in Irkutsk province, oil refinery in East Siberia. So investments take place, and they are quite forceful. If together we count without intentions, we will come to about 66, 70 billion dollars. Already Chinese invested into Russian economy. The money is target money where the fuel and energy, where oil and gas. I'm not saying that the investments are not paying back. Really, it's very good for China that doesn't have uh, own resources. It's very good for Russia that has excess resources. And this excess should be realized together with Chinese. Why such investments take place? In my understanding, I'm not a minister or deputy minister. I can afford to say what I can say, because all these projects have curator. 
there's somebody to talk to. The curator of this project says the president of the Russian Federation. If the problem can happen with one of these projects, if you all see who investor is in all these projects, is Sinopec, CNPC, and Fund of Silkway. The states communicate amongst themselves. The Chinese need a man who is responsible for the investments that are done today. This is my observation. We need to have responsible person to talk to if there is any problem, if there is any issue. And this responsible person should have capacity to take help at the point of time when he supposed to help. If there is good governor whom you believe, they will invest money. The profitability of our projects is much higher than profitability of the projects in Pakistan or Ecuador or Argentina. is much higher. Investments in our economy is much more interesting and safer. But you need curator, strong man, strong partner, reliable partner with whom they will go along. And I'd like to show you, just look at investments outside of the energy. The Deputy Minister declared that there's three billion. Perhaps there is three billion, but I believe it's just intention. As for the concrete ones, I tried to find with my analyst. I wasn't able to find. There is broad fuselage, long distance airplane that Valentina Matvienko spoke. It's just only discussions. The good words about Chinese and Russia is dialogue. It's just dialogue taking place. And all investments of which you spoke outside of fuel and energy, this is dialogue. No more, the, no less. There is assessment. There are some shifts. But outside of the fuel and energy, I don't see any shifts. The number of the dialogues with Rosnano, Rossetti, uh, Foreign Investment Fund, and Business Incubator, there is no responsible person for these projects. Then look, if we calculate how much investment in the Russian energy and non-energy, we look at what indicator we come to. Ninety-eight percent of investment of China is the investment into financing and purchase of stocks and entrant participation in equity. And this is how our relationship are being built between Russia and China. Where should we go? Now, take a look. What's the danger? If we don't immediately start diversification, and this is the challenge for our Chinese fellows, if we immediately stop, start diversify our relationship and find common understanding in, of investments in different areas, and I later will mention them, and then relationship between Russia and China will be the hostage of the price of oil and gas or price of the product where no us, no China have any influence. And this is the price for hydrocarbons. Let's talk openly. We had relationship. We have relationship with Europe, with Turkey, with Belarus, with Ukraine. We all remember the picture. Uh, let me exaggerate. When Mr. Kupriyanov came with Colossus and it was cold, it was New Year, and he said the price for this uh, that year is too high, uh, the price is too low, and these discussions, disputes brought us to deep conflict. I'm sure that there will be activist and activist within companies just like the same in Chinese companies. They'll say that such investments are the price we buy oil and gas in Russia is high. I'm sure that there'll be the same activist in Russia who will say it's low. It will be reported to the political leadership. We'll have deja vu that we have with Europe, with 
Ukraine, with Turkey, with Belarus. Do we want it? No, we don't. For this, we need very quick measures in diversification of our relationship with reputable comrades from China, but it depends on them as well. It depends on them, as I said. I compare the return on investment, like in uh, Pakistan, the dam or the bridge or something in South America, and compare the investment indicators, investment model for the projects in Russia. It's absolutely different. We're much better than any investment in any industry in the world. For now, we don't have common language. For now, we don't have common language in investments. Alexander Vysanov will show you investment into the road projects. And I believe that the project is very good. We face only in this project with the state guarantees. And Mr. Zanov is right. He said that there's special law in Russia that fits our Chinese friends and us, and investments can take place. Why I'm saying this? Because if all the time we say that barriers, bureaucratic barriers, or the laws don't provide, or the system that we've built is different from Ch Chinese, this is not true. In any case, we can find in any case, we can find the escape way if investments are desirable and if they desire to invest. Just one minute. That stops me. I'm telling all of you, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're always very sincere. In this sense, it is pleasant to ask uncomfortable questions to you. Tell us, please, is my understanding correct that China invests in us, not like the economy filled with projects, but rather as the some kind of set of state relationships or the personal relationships, judging by what you said, it's personal guarantor that uh, guarantees the project. Can we expand? It is clear that these relationships obviously are limited by the size of the state or something else, but can we come to the private sector? What is your take? Why private Russian and private Chinese sectors, between them, there are more state relationships. Our Chinese comrades look at the regional expansion in China. Let's try to understand their logics. Yes, there are private investors. Yes, there is private claimant, but there is a land. The land is ruled by the governor or the ruled by the power. The project is under authority of these people. The relationships, the governor, the claimant, and the investor, it creates triangle. It's very important for our Chinese friends. And this is uh, part of mentality of the expansion even inside of country, China. We have to build relationships like this. And we need to realize these projects quickly, because I'm saying again, we'll be the hostage of identical problems that we've had with Europe, with Ukraine, with Belarus, with Turkey. And the bad relationship with China will not be relevant neither for us nor for them. Did I answer your question? Yes, I understand you. I try to say, I think I understand you. We have got a big problem. What is the interest of Russian authority in Russian private sector? How much support level not related directly to the manual control? If we have big project, we can have biscuits for this, and I monitor, and I'm responsible. But are the other projects? Uh, uh, rotating somehow, and I'll try to translate what you mentioned. You're a smart man. You understood everything. Thank you. Uh, wait a second. I mean, colleague, colleagues, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, dear colleagues. I'm sorry. Uh, that us leave all of the questions towards the end because we're trying to move at a fast pace, and uh, the speakers were quite carrying. 
thaw water. I asked them, so you will get an opportunity to ask a question. I now will remember where you're seated, and so I will definitely give you a chance, a guarantee. And so, Andrei Klepisch, Deputy Chairman of the Board, member of uh, the Board of Venetian Bank, also member of the Russian International Affairs Councils. So, here's the floor to you, because I suspect that you will be able to tell us uh, quite a few interesting details after your wealth of experience of a uh, common activity with the Chinese partners. Thank you. My relatively wealthy experience is more related to the Russian economy rather than the Chinese one. But maybe I should uh, note on a few issues, uh, a few fork roads, so to say, because indeed I do believe that both the Chinese and Russian economies with all due differences that they may have are quite similar in their state, which is transiting towards a somewhat different development model related to quite a big uncertainty. With respect to China, many argue to what extent it may slow down and what may happen to the Chinese banking or financial systems and the crisis which everybody, um, without any success, has been waiting to happen for the past 10 to 15 years. But nevertheless, it is evident that the Chinese economy is encountering both the slowdown of its space of growth as well as with the change of priorities related to the development of the internal territories and provinces and many other aspects as well. But as applied to Russia, there is a continuous argument going on in one way or another. What we're facing is that during the past few years, we are into one crisis, and out into another one crisis, and stagnation. So if you are not to engage in sadomasochism, one shouldn't really compare the decline of the Chinese uh, economic development uh, pace comparing it with others. Although we act on an assumption that the Russian economy will accelerate its growth, that there is uh, some sort of recovery has started. So it's either going to be very conservative in accordance with the official government uh, outlook about 1.5 percent, below 2 percent within the next few years, or we will be in a position to uh, really speed it up, up to 2 to 3 percent, which nevertheless is uh, considerably lower than the rate of growth of the Chinese economy. At the same time, and Alexei Vladimirovich referred to it in the very beginning, we experienced quite a decline in our mutual uh, trade mostly on the pricing side when uh, the gas prices plummeted, but also the physical uh, trade volumes went down. When one way or another, there are ambitious plans at play. There is a level of almost 900 billion of mutual trade turnover by 2020. I guess currently we are nearing up to 80. But uh, still, it is considerably less than what we had a few years ago. But the issue is not in these figures or the oil price outlook, but uh, in that the true structure of trade must change. But how? Now, speaking about the kind of role that uh, the Chinese investments have into the oil and gas industry, but essentially the Russian exports in terms of the 64% of its value is the hydrocarbons. And bearing in mind the expected uh, project in terms of the power severe and the refining capacities and the East Siberian pipeline capacity, I believe that the concentration in the oil and gas uh, sector in the next few years would grow. And through it, we will increase our trading volumes, even if the oil prices are not going to grow significantly and will stay around $50 per barrel. So consequently, that is a question. Where are other niches? Are there any left? Uh, because the spectrum of products that we've been talking about is quite broad, and indeed certain positive changes have started taking place in trading. But agricultural products up to 1 billion US, there are supplies of machine building product, uh, the very high level of processing laser technology um, to China. But nevertheless, the potential of seeing the activity grow in all these niches is limited. And I believe that without a serious change in the economic structures and uh, engaging into other approaches, we also need to work in a different way in marketing and subsidizing and the Russian exports. We won't be able to gain any significant growth. 
just now somebody mentioned the question where the Chinese investments are going. But effectively, there is a major difference not only in the statistical way of seeing it, and there have been quite a few cases. Generally speaking, according to international requirements, these are not direct investments. These are the loans extended towards such projects as the Marlin and G and Rosneft's project and others, but looking at direct foreign investments. Despite all of the memorandums of intent, the real Chinese investment into Russia run up to about two billion US dollars accumulated by now. There is a certain level, a certain bar, which was set to go up to 12 billion. And in many ways, there is a big portfolio of projects at hand. And the ones which were considered by the Joint Russian-Chinese uh, Commission and the ones which are currently being debated about the Far Eastern regions, these are minimum investors. And they are growing even much slower than Chinese investments into other regions, Africa, Latin America, and Pakistan. For one. And here, what we see is that we need to have some sort of a breakthrough, changing our approaches to investments, both on the Russian and the Chinese sides. And I do uh, agree with the first that who said that you've got to have a uh, supervisor just changing the investment climate alone is not enough. But such a supervisor should not necessarily be a president. And what I would draw attention to is when Alexander was saying that when they're setting up a certain center, like a one-stop window, in order to support and you know, facilitate Chinese projects in the Far East. But there is a reverse side to this coin. On the one hand, out of what I can see, there is a bit of a lack of trust amongst the Russian businesses and partners to, towards the Chinese investment because quite often they're related not only to a lack of understanding, but uh, quite often to different scheming and to some very complicated arrangements that are being forced upon the Russian partners for using Chinese equipment, Chinese labor, and financial terms, the so-called Chinese content. If we want to count upon a serious growth of Chinese investments into Russia, here, you also need to attain it uh, to seriously change approaches and the requirements that you are placing upon the Chinese uh, partners. But on the other hand, there is a question, what are we ready to offer in exchange? And which are the areas where we are ready to go in for joint projects and investment? Because the Chinese, back in 2000, undertook this enormous leap through setting up joint ventures. Well. Joint ventures as such is something that we don't have in numbers. We are talking about different projects. We are discussing the have a helicopter project, for example, but this is really not a joint project yet because we are acting here as suppliers of technology and design because this is our MI-26, but uh, just upgraded like uh, you know, MI-38. But one way or another, in the future, this may become a joint production. We have plans, and we heard it about the wide-body uh, aircraft where we're acting as equitable partners. I think the entity has been set up with a minimum capital. But furthermore, if we want to develop it, I should say this is not going to be 13 billion, but much more. But in any case, on the Russian side, we're not able to invest into it that much considering the state of our United Aircraft Building Corporation and the state of other financial institutions in Russia. And so this is going to be a fork rose. Now, will it be a joint venture? Or this essentially may become an entity where Russia will act as a contractor in designing and developing this aircraft because we used to have our own experience of uh, producing the uh, white fuselage aircraft. And in this sense, we are having the kind of competences that the Chinese are interested in using. And there are other projects as well where one may see a qualitatively new mechanism being set up. The Harris mentioned the Meridian project. And uh, I believe that Mr. Rosana will tell us more about it. But this is also a project that we have been deliberating for a few years, several projects, I should say, the high-speed uh, rail project in two dimensions. This is Moscow, Kazan, and a more global project, which is related uh, to promoting this and putting down this line through Kazakhstan to the north west of China. And this idea of a global infrastructure, which is not just a purely economic project, because the most important question is not how to load it up. 
on the way back this uh, high-speed trains uh, from Europe to China. I mean, I don't think it will be too much in trouble to find cargo for it, but this is the kind of project which creates a totally different infrastructure in the Central Asia and China. And so in this sense, this is indeed a project which conforms to the ideology of uh, one belt, one way and uh, is compliant with the plans of the development of the Eurasian space, which we ourselves in Russia were entertaining, um, amongst other things, because of the development of the Eurasian Union. But this project, as far as I can recall, has been discussed for about six or seven years. And so far, we haven't even been able to sign the intergovernmental agreement. And so in this sense, one needs to undertake some daring systemic steps on the Russian side, because if we want to act as a partner to China, we must not be reactive but proactive and come up with our own ideas. And only in this way we'll be able to achieve a totally new quality in this Eurasian space. And so I think that both Russia and China are currently uh, facing the kind of the folk roots which we previously used to have in our relations with Europe and the one that we lost because many years ago we also, during the period of our warm period of relations with Europe and uh, the plans of creating a single economic space from Europe to the Urals or to the Pacific Ocean. We were talking about how we are going to combine the financial technology of Europe with the Russian brain power and the Russian resources, which we have been actively exporting uh, both into Europe, US, and China. But uh, because of the current political environment, although Europe remains our biggest trading partner and financial partner to a lesser extent, though, this is the project which was put on hold. And I guess that we'll be able to revisit it uh, only in many years. But the same issue comes up with China. Will we be able to realistically change the format of relations that we're having and combine our resources and our technological acumen, which in many ways exceeds the Chinese one, also the gap is closing, and the financial and labor resources in China. Only then, indeed, there may ensue a principally new Eurasian space. I'm being optimistic, and so I believe that this project will come up, and uh, the financial industry here, where I simply represent the financial institution, will be uh, going in the wake of this project, rather than playing a key role. Thank you very much, Andrei Nikolaevich. I got uh, a very small question. I do not know whether you might recall, but it seems to me that exactly a year ago at this uh, venue, you used to say that 2015 in the relationship with China was somehow off the expectation and was a disappointment. But in 2016, you mentioned that certain positive changes are to come. You said it, and simply because uh, those were just uh, the uh, saplings. Um, I don't remember anything being specific. But do you remember anything which uh, turned itself into something useful? Maybe it was not at this forum, but definitely it was four months ago. And this is the kind of statement that you made. Have you noticed anything out of this green shoots to grow into a stout tree? Well. I believe that the economy right now is rather lagging behind such a geopolitical cooperation. Effectively, not only 2016, but uh, back in 2015, a very important geopolitical statement was made about uh, adjoining the Eurasian Union and uh, one uh, about one way, uh, I mean, project. Now, the question is what it can be filled with because during 2016 we were in very active negotiations and several times we were planning to sign agreements about the high speed train connection and the wide body aircraft but in terms of the wide body aircraft uh, we were able to sign an agreement but that was only a very very initial stage in terms of the high speed train we are still in negotiations and uh, so the issue is again about uh, fulfilling these geopolitical steps with tangible infrastructural and high-tech projects. So maybe slower than what was the expectation. There didn't happen any economic breakthrough, but nevertheless, the move towards a positive uh, outcome is there. Now, in the oil and gas industry, it is much more um, active movement is taking place because uh, there are very strong business uh, stakeholders in it. All right, right now, thank you very much. Now, look. Dear colleagues, now preempting the next speaker, I wanted to note the following thing. 
uh, two um, uh, speakers from the Ministry of Economic Development and the Ministry for the Development of the Far East noted on the following point, which I would generalize. Uh, it seems that uh, knowledge and education is something that we lack about each other. And so the next speaker, Alexei Kachanov, Deputy General Director um, in the Strategy uh, for the Foundation for Educational Program, I wanted to ask him the direct question. Could you possibly, after you uh, finish your presentation or in the course of your presentation, to elaborate upon it, know what with the education is currently happening. Can we try and improve the situation? Will it be enough to provide necessary info to both parties in terms of having them uh, undertake uh, the explosive, no, if not explosive growth, but at least notable growth in our cooperation? Can we try something and change in the conservatory? In other words, yes, uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and thank you for this question. I will try and uh, make an attempt. Can I ask the uh, projectors to uh, put the slideshow on? The Ross Nano Group is made up of two big parts, essentially, and we are working in the market for direct venture investments. We are creating the startups on the one hand. On the other hand, we are developing and uh, sc scaling the businesses out. And it all started back in 2007 because there was a government corporation which was then transformed into a joint stock company currently. Uh, we have quite an extended entity uh, called the uh, Rox Nano Joint Stock Company, 100% government-owned entity, which consolidates into itself the government's involvement in this particular economic sector. We have a uh, Rox Nano management uh, company, which in a professional way manages both the government money as well as the you know, private projects, setting up uh, funds with other organizations. We also have the foundation for the infrastructural educational programs, exactly the one which is dealing with setting up the startups in developing the infrastructure industry in the high-tech nanotechnology sectors, thanks to which there are being established in great numbers new startup companies. Now, in as far as the uh, Foundation for the Infrastructural Educational Programs, FIOP, that's the Russian translation, that is where we see the separation between the educational activity, the activities uh, aimed at supporting everything that has been created in Russia. And so here we are very deeply involved, not only in the themes, but also the issues and problems problems related to those individual decisions and individual processes uh, with uh, separate individual supervisors, uh, without mentioning the president of Russia, but a great number of very active people we have in this country who want to do something and who actually do something. And so in this sense, that tier of uh, the uh, representatives from China, uh, the ones who our colleagues were referring to, yes, indeed, in Russia, you find certain specificities, uh, which is either described as a supervisor or curator, um, or, uh, I mean, related to the fact that somebody is willing to and pushes for and uh, acts rather than discusses. Now, in terms of the infrastructure, a lot of things have been established in terms of the number of jobs, the amount of taxes paid um, out of already existing startups, the nano centers who on their own are acting as the creators of startups, representing a bit of a mix uh, in between laboratories, incubators, accelerators, you know, all put together. We are actively working in the educational sphere, understanding that specialists are not enough in order to really go into certain innovative projects where Russia has traditionally been very strong or traditionally has had the capacity to transform its knowledge potential into a really operating businesses. But then on, let's pay tribute to the differences and to the state that we are finding ourselves in and uh, which specifically our partners are finding themselves in, partners from China. We're practically are way different if we are to talk about GDP, the sixth largest world economy from the point of view of the level of penetration of private equity into the economy. I mean, the kind of direct investments and the venture capital investments which uh, we can find in the country, the Russian economy constitutes just one hundredth percent of the GDP. I mean, in terms of the private investments being directed uh, according to the international methodologies, even if we, uh, you know, gauge by the by the results of 2016, 
11 hundredths of a percent. On the one hand, it means that this particular area doesn't make a great contribution to the GDPs of each country. On the other hand, if we take a look in the reverse, in Russia, we have this particular segment very strongly concentrated, and so be it Rosnano or VEB Innovations or Skolkovo, each of such entities, and I've just enumerated the government development institutions, so if we add on top of it the private ones, which have been around for so long, bearing Vostok, Russia Capital Partners, and the esteemed colleagues over here on the panel who are also related to a number of projects, this sector is quite narrow, but on the other hand, it is very much concentrated, and so in this regard, every participant represents a bit of a very serious influence of the projects that we have in this country. Of course, we're not trying to talk only about oil, gas, and natural resources. But if we go into the processing and from it into the innovative technologies related to the oil services, so here we see the kind of cooperation that could happen in its uh, full swing. Now, overall, speaking about the Russian market dynamics, it has certainly been very much narrowed down by the economic uh, decline which took place in 2014-15, as well as what will happen with our currency. And so the market, generally speaking, plummeted. And in this regard, its international component changed. But at the same time, from the point of view of interaction, I would like to draw attention to the fact that we've got a lot of things in common, be it in mindset, the ways of doing business, and most importantly, about the way we view innovation in high tech and the way they should affect uh, both countries' economies. Uh, specifically, uh, both the countries are members of BRICS. Uh, we're being actively watched in this same capacity by the whole halo of economists uh, and whatnot. And at the same time, each of our countries is an acknowledged uh, regional leader. As far as Russia is concerned, its influence over the CS markets and the bigger segment of an existing marketplace is undoubted. Equally like the undoubted is the Chinese influence over the territory of the whole of the uh, Southeast Asia. It's uh, really not a grateful thing to talk about the private equity and try and confirm it with examples because we are continuously under the NDAs different. This we cannot talk about, that we cannot talk about. But if one is to generalize, the majority of the companies which have been set up and operate as part of the cooperation between the Russian Federation, the above mentioned uh, foundations, and the foreign foundations where one finds Chinese capital and equity, we are confronted very often either with uh, an establishment of a foundation between Russia and China, which invests into Israel. We are looking at the very same technology that we're interested in. We understand together and we consider together the way these technologies may help uh, the Chinese economy and the Russian economy understand. So it really turns out to be more interesting because when we, Rosnano, when investing into Israel, really find more fitting the outlook of our Chinese colleagues rather than the various this grand Israeli industry. And so we decided to set up this foundation with the Chinese colleagues to invest into Israel rather than with the local Israelis. So any company which receives investments from such a source, from such a structure, automatically becomes somewhat of a member of the pool of what is related to Russia as well as China. And both on our side and as well as on the Chinese side, each of us is sitting on the board and we take the companies to meet with the technology leaders that we have in our both countries. So whatever applies to telecoms, you know, Chinese colleagues automatically bring their companies in. The private equity really takes off through this part of the industry and the investments in the technologies which were you know, discovered abroad, amongst other things, in each of our countries, be it a Russian company, Israeli company, etc. This is what enables us to reach out to the adjacent territories. I mentioned the CAS uh, markets that Russia can open up an entry to, the Southeastern Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, that our Chinese partners uh, may help enter. Even not all the investments ultimately arrive at China, considering the regional aspects uh, that uh, uh, a country or a nation has, amongst other things. Now, as far as Rose Nano is concerned, we are very well aware of what is available here. We can act as a 
very productive partner. We understand quite well, and we are encountering the kind of difficulties which not only manifested themselves in 2014 and 15. I mean, the international economic environment affected the exchange rates in such a way which affected Russia so strongly. There are peculiarities which one finds in the government regulations in terms of the Chinese foreign investments. We also encounter it and we treat with understanding the fact that the Chinese leadership also needs to uh, further fine tune this sector and connect it with the kind of trends which took place in the uh, state in 2016. This is the slide whereby, where of an example, I decided to demonstrate the kind of cooperation that is already in place, specifically in as far as our Israeli fund is concerned, where both the Chinese and the Russian investments are working hand in hand. The current announced equity size is 160 million US dollars, and we're also planning that in the very near future it will fully exhaust itself, and we will be confronted uh, with the need to set up the next one. It is also worth noting that in every case that we see, and which is the peculiarity of uh, our cooperation to both us as well as our Chinese investor colleagues, in parallel with the investments which we are currently making, are looking at other opportunities to continue working together with these companies, both in terms of the transfer technologies back into their homeland, as well as in terms of the further development of direct equity investments into the very same companies, not out of the fund, not through the fund, having exit from the equities from these companies through the fund, but to continue interacting with them in the next stage of things. Well, I guess this is it out of the uh, main things and points which I wanted to share with you. Now, well, I think I'm ready to answer your questions. Well, I mean, the first one, yes, uh, what do you think? Uh, education, uh, should it be? Because you are uh, the closest uh, position to education out of all panelists. But this is a very important uh, question. Is there enough uh, information available? or? Or, and the second point, you, you mentioned to the curators, the supervisors, I mean, there is a need to have such an individual or an entity. And I do understand that you are able to resolve certain level of problems, but uh, it sounds like you're not enough for billions of US dollars. Hundreds of millions could be the limit, if I may, not very appropriate uh, observation, but nevertheless, the one which rationally comes out of what you've just described. Yes, 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 let's be more specific. Uh, you see, from the point of view of education, on the one hand, the current educational processes between our two countries are not strongly interrelated. You should definitely admit that, because uh, the significance of the Chinese universities is growing at almost the similar pace our federal universities are going in terms of the citations, etc. But in China, this process started earlier. The uh, process of fighting for Nobel laureates uh, began earlier. So in this regard, in the educational area, we're not very much complementing each other. On the other hand, in the area of academic uh, education, uh, I mean, specifically engineering ones, we have sufficiently great a uh, pool of water already is in existence because that comes from the historic heritage. So uh, in this sense, uh, in the area of uh, scientific uh, research and scientific schools in Russia, we're much better off uh, at this level than with the student pool. So this is my personal view. Now, from the point of view of curatorship and uh, supervisors, Rosnana is the foundation which manages several billion dollars of uh, equity, and these several billions is what we also split in between different sectors and interests and areas. Every sub-foundation of foundation is, let's say, within one billion, uh, just uh, to make it comfortable. So in this sense, uh, the projects cannot be worth uh, billions of dollars, and every foundation is sensible uh, limit uh, to for such project is hundreds of million US dollars, which envisage that the company would strongly grow during the forthcoming period that so private equity is making its earnings from a very dramatic scaling because it would be difficult for us to start from $10 billion and turn them into 100. This is not the scale of our organization. Just to turn 100 million into 1.5 billion, yes, this is the uh, target that we're trying to achieve. Now, supervisorship, yes. That uh, is applicable to it because that uh, means working with the government companies, for example, against the fact that there is a power of Siberia and there is a participation of the Chinese partners and there is a number of high-tech companies whose decision-making was put into the foundation of the subsequent development of the power of Siberia related to its growth of valuation and capitalization to five-fold, depending upon at which point in time investors get into it. So there is a bigger power of Siberia project and 
there are various opportunities that as we as Rosnana were able to see and uh, really utilize it and that is where we were able to provide support to a number of companies earn some money ourselves you know bring in technologies so it was a multiple win-win in there yes 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 thank you very much thank you and I would like to pass the microphone over to Mr. Anni Hajan the general director of the Chinese oil and gas management office in Russia oh. Oh. Sorry, I don't see. I had a feeling I have a uh, three. I'm sorry. Then, uh, all right now. As for the rest, I hear. So I'll ask, ask the question. Thank you once again. I'm sorry again, colleagues. In this case, Mr. Rizana Alexander Nikolai, chairman of the board of the Russian holding company. Thank you very much. Andrei Nikolaevich already said few words about our project. We worked much with web. And I'll try to very briefly tell about our project, the infrastructural project, and tell why it has the right to live and why it really is um, profitable. If you look at the map and see two main cities, Shanghai and Hamburg, where the main flows come. I have to roll back slightly. All right, this is right. Where the main flows of the f shipments and cargoes come, it's about 14 million standard containers that travel by sea. This is really cheap, but it takes about 30, 45 days to travel. Further, aviation that takes three to five days, but this is radically more expensive, and you cannot carry so much cargo and there are many shipments that come through Alibaba are sold in Russia they fly by plane and railway that today is operational and if you look at uh, at, at the Harbos Dastek as the border of China and uh, Kazakhstan until Brest city and there is a rail flow of about 10, 11 days for travel last year, we transported record amount of containers, 116,000 units in 25 years. We'll have about a million, and this is really container trains. That is very convenient, but you have infrastructural limitation. No modern containers will not be able to transport. And then automotive road. If we had automotive road from Shanghai to Hamburg, to Hamburg, then we believe that about 11 days we can travel by car, by automobile, and carry cargo not to uh, seaport, but have to door-to-door -door delivery. What prevents us from doing this today? It's the absence of the red line, is the absence of road in the territory of the Russian Federation, because Russian colleagues for a long time built Shanghai Hobbes Road is about 3,700 kilometers. It is operational for lanes, two lanes, one direction, two lanes, different direction. Kazakhstan is finishing, already finished. Karchino Road is the transition point to Orenburg province, 2,700 kilometers. In absence of the Russian fragment, doesn't allow the transit of the cargo. Our project implies to build a road in the Russian territory. You see a red strip. It's eight uh, regions of the Russian Federation. We try to do about uh, 2,000 kilometers. We try to make this road outside of all communities. And the main objective that we have is to form a land corridor. But as far as you know, all land in the Russian Federation practically belongs to the private individuals. These are mostly agricultural lands. We've done a lot of work to coordinate and to purchase this land and to draw this road outside of the national parks and private, uh, private lands so we don't have any challenges on the part of the environmentalists and in infrastructure owners, so we formed its 100 meters corridor wide. The land was purchased about 70 to 80 percent. Even majority, we conducted survey. In order to make this road exist, we need to have a lot of investment. 
If we simultaneously do it, in three to four years, we can build such a road. And this is first class road, two lanes in each direction. But we understand that this is rather difficult. And we opted for making two stages. First stage, we wanted to build in the territory of Orenburg province 430 kilometers. It's green on the slide. And then existing federal highways go to the central ring road and in 2020 will open the central ring is being constructed now by the 2020 it will be built and along the m1 we can come to belarus it's the first stage that will allow to open traffic that is important in our understanding and the second the m4 road to extend this road m4 you no know, the best in russia it's four-lane road and also the same to the central ring and then M1 and then to Belarus. And the last stage to accomplish the entire project. We have a high level of preparedness. We conducted negotiations and uh, we have support at rather high level. And we discuss who is the supervisor. Our supporter is the Russian government including first vice prime minister mr shuvalov is supporting us and the minister of transport because our road is included into international traffic corridor it is already there and it is written in many intergovernmental contracts we presented our road to the newly created bank uh, the asian bank of infrastructural investments and just last week we had a meeting here with the minister of economics of the russian federation with our participation because this is one of the projects that nowadays is being considered as uh, a target for investment in the russian federation as for the preparedness i'll show you another slide uh, we show that we have a high level of preparedness and uh, re readiness and uh, it will not be easy to read, but I can say out loud at 1,100 kilometers, we conducted geo, geo survey, we conducted project work with one of the provinces. And nowadays we have full understanding how much one kilometer of the road will cost for investors so we can build full road. What is, in my view, what are the problems in, in the area of relationship between Russian and Chinese investors? We conducted consultations and negotiations with the Chinese companies. This is all state companies, very large companies with huge turnover. But the first question they ask, they say, very interesting, very interesting. But tell us, will you give state guarantee? And then we'll gladly come to you. You know that. Fundamentally, Russian Federation doesn't give state guarantees. I don't know any commercial projects with a state support guarantee. And if we do have such guarantee, we wouldn't have any investment problem. We would find investments anywhere, including in China. That's why the state guarantee, we say no. If there is no state guarantee, then as the colleague said, he said that China is monitoring closely at the political decisions. If there's political decision to invest and investments come, if at the highest level it was not stated, there will be waiting until the moment when such uh, conversation happen. On the other hand, when we speak to Chinese colleagues, for instance, why not Chinese companies have Chinese government guarantee? Because China, first of all, is interested in transit transit of uh, cargoes to Western Europe. For them, it's very important road that the cargo can travel, not by sea, not by railway, but also by automotive road. Everyone understands that presence of such road, availability of such road is good import opportunity for Russian products to China because it was stated by the colleagues. One of the potential of export is the agriculture. If you look at a road, it runs through eight provinces of the Russian Federation that actively works in the agriculture industry. If we have chance to transport, we can transport to China and from China because we understand that China purchases and will be purchasing and extends the future purchase of the foods from the Russian Federation because quality is yet good. 
Now, why not private business? The response is there. The response is the Chinese private business is accustomed to high profitability. For instance, yes, I'm finishing. We spoke to the Russian direct investment fund that has a fund together with Chinese. They see about 20% in hot currency. But such projects in Russian Federation are non-existent. I don't know of any. So it's impossible. We hope very much that together with web, we can do it. Because web can pose as the integrator of the project. We know that web had internal difficulties. But as far as we know, they're taken care of. And the Chinese banks are not willing to directly invest. They want to have in Russia some kind of the buffer integrator that could uh, integrate and assemble and provide quasi-guarantees. And the last stated here, we consider opportunity to work as the concession, because concession law in the Russian Federation provides opportunity for investors in our project as a guarantee of the lost traffic, missed traffic. That's why, according to the statute, it's not direct state guarantee, but the promise of the government. So I'm finished. If you have any questions, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> I have got uh, one clarification question. Why not China give guarantee for this road? Tell us, does China need to have guarantee? Who is interested more in this road? We, Kazakhstan or China? Because China has alternative routes. And they have comfort in investing in Pakistan. They'll build perfect road to the seaport, shorter length, and I believe cheaper. As for the Russian territory, they have transip. In greater sense, we expand. There will not be so much coal, so we have to fill with containers. The reason for saying this, uh, does China need it? It needs to draw tent tentacles. It's not the only road. What is the take? The sea, I, I believe it, uh, they all have right to leave. But this is different transport scheme. When we talk about automotive road, the direct automotive communication between Western Europe and China is non-existent. This road would be the only source to deliver quickly cargoes, expensive cargoes, for which the transport cost is not relevant. It's the cargo from China to Europe. If we look at the cargo flows, we see that in automotive roads, if you have three, uh, 300, 400 thousand dollars, it can be easily transported by car, by automobile. Why not China give guarantee if they provide traffic for this road? If they provide traffic, they will have return on investment. So this is the uh, idea. All right, thank you very much. The next speaker is Mr. Shidze, Director of Programs of the Council of the Strategic Interaction, Chief Research Fellow, former Vice President of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Mr. Xi. I'm from Beijing, the Chinese Institute of International Research. Today, I'd like to to, to talk to you, to talk about the issue of the enlargement of Russian-Chinese collaboration at, through disclosure of the internal energy. I've noticed that colleagues speak Russian, but I'd like to speak Chinese. If I change the program of my presentation and have the shortest thoughts and how to express it. Can I do it? Like my colleagues, I'll speak in Chinese language. I believe that today we have internal impulses and internal incentives that stimulate deepening of the Russian and Chinese collaboration. 
And if we rely fully on external factors, internal impulses, it is impossible to believe they are healthy impulses. Luckily, at this time, we have number of the internal stimuli that allow both countries, both sides to deepening political and social economic collaboration. There is a number of the positive factors, number of the negative factors. Speaking about the positive factors, we're talking about the following uh, centers of economical development. It moves to the Asia-Pacific region, and this creates certain positive conditions for deepening of the collaboration between our countries and also relying on this growth point. At this time, we increase the influence of the internal demand. This is an uh, internal factor that stimulates the growth. Further, it is necessary to pay attention to the factors of the complementary um, complementary factors because there is a level of complementarity between our two countries. And by strengthening investment, interaction, and collaboration between our countries, we can achieve even better success level. Just recently in Beijing, we had forum of one belt, one way. And in my presentation, I'll tell all the best representative of the participants of creation of this special investment fund that uh, would support the project as part of the initiative One Belt, One Way, and also declare improvement and enhancing of the funding, such funds such as Silkway Fund and other financial institutions by way of One Belt, One Way. We have new opportunities for development of economical develop, uh, collaboration between our two countries. But internal impulses, they uh, meet the challenges. The question is this. The stage we are experiencing now whether it is ideal point of time to enhance economical collaboration and investment collaboration, or the stage was passed, and we didn't pay attention to it in the past. The leadership of our countries pay attention to the economical cooperation and creates favorable conditions for investment and trading for both two countries and for the collaboration between enterprises of our country. Speaking about economical, speaking about energy, many countries export energy resources, including liquefied natural gas, oil, oil products. The countries of North America presented initiative to increase exports of oil products in China. We should think whether it's worth to enhance this export, whether it is reasonable to increase export of such products in China. Production of new products and uh, utilization of new technologies will help to decrease to increase the volume, the percent percentage that in economical structure and uh, import structure is occupying. There is another negative factor which I'd like to, to tell you about. As part of the initiative One Belt, One Way, China 
pay special attention to the construction of infrastructure. How to solve existing problems of the absence of mutual understanding between our enterprises and relationships of the construction of new infrastructure. It is necessary to wait at the highest level the, how to distribute roles between participants of realization of infrastructural project, how to distribute volume shares, including investments between Russia and Chinese financial institutions, including uh, how to take care of guarantees of which previous speakers mentioned, further development of industrial parks. It is necessary to enhance interaction between enterprises, between state enterprises for production, for, for development of the industrial parks. I'd like to note that uh, development of economical cooperation uh, relates to, first of all, n to the necessity to improve investment uh, collaboration between our two countries. It is necessary to solve the question of the shortage of information, and I believe that in this sense, the consulting companies can play a hu important role. Also, our countries can discuss the opportunity to organize at the high level cooperation between brain, brain centers, between intellectual centers analytical centers of our countries that uh, will jointly discuss the results of analytical research, research on different projects and on the strategy of our cooperation. Further, there is necessity to create innovative mechanism for interaction. There is necessity to perfect the mechanism. It is necessary to discuss with our Russian partners the question of organization of production of, of high technology products, of uh, high te tech products, and improve existing mechanism of cooperation and deepening of the cooperation. It will be a new direction of our cooperation. Thank you very much, Mr. Xi. I have a question to you. Don't you believe? I have a question. Don't you believe that potentially, in part, a problem of our cooperation is that we're trying to have discussion of our joint projects at the highest level, but even for Russia, with our more than trillion dollar scale of ec economy, $10 billion project is not profitable at such level of discussion, save for China with 10 times big economy. The leadership of both countries that have to be involved into the secondary in terms of scale problems. In principle, it is impossible to quickly promote this projects because of the objectives. This project, in terms of economical indicators, cannot be important. Maybe it is worth for us to provide conditions that not even lesser level the officials, but the business itself can solve relevant problems. And this way, our cooperation will be one degree better as opposed to in involvement of the highest public officials. Uh, 
I believe that the key question is this. The market plays key role or the influence of the government decision on the top level has key role. Last year, the turnover, the trading turnover was uh, 300 billion. The trading turnover with China was 300 billion dollars and the market played key role in the initiation of the uh, trading collaboration with Korea. Uh, that means that the market, the market factor is, the market is the factor of growth of the business cooperation. Otherwise, the role of the government is the key. We need to discuss, discuss this question. few decades, majority of the Russian enterprises were medium and small businesses. China didn't have not a single large enterprise. Later situation changed and we noticed that uh, it is necessary to pay attention to the growth of the large enterprises, how to incentivize activity of the large enterprises and also intensify incentivize small and medium businesses. I'm not sure if I gave you the right answer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Xi. And I'd like to give the floor to Polakov, Ivan Viktor, General Director of Interstate Corporation for Development, Deputy Chairman of the Russian Chinese Business Council, member of the RIAC. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to point out that the most important aspect uh, in developing of high-tech cooperation between China and Russia is the issue of the uh, retaining of the intellectual property because successful examples of operation of large transnational corporations in China is not for the Russian high-tech companies the model for one simple reason. What can Apple, Samsung, or other high technology giants can afford? Majority cannot afford, uh, the Russian companies cannot afford. I mean, the model that is well established when company comes to China, starts developing production of this or that product, and after two or three years, they create samples of new generation and um, retain leadership position and earlier productive by continental Russian Chinese companies. Unfortunately, this question was set at different level. Unfortunately, it was not solved. And I believe that the answer to this question, if we want to move or slightly uh, improve the position for the high technology and uh, science intensive projects, we need to create special regimes to provide uh, integrity of intellectual property between CPR and, and Russia. It is also necessary to think of non-traditional ways of promoting of any projects, the different joint projects, in particular Russian projects. As an example, we can use rather known, well known, President, when the Russian president, Mr. Putin, gave to Chairman C Russian ice cream, which entailed explosive demand for Russian ice cream in China, and export in China is uh, so special. It is several times higher. It is growing several, several fold. It is important to know and understand. It can be example of the statement made by one of the speakers today who said that the scale of attention of the leaders towards different projects measured in billions of dollars not always is appropriate but in my view it speaks about different thing if we talk about attention of the president of Russia to the food industry for instance uh, ice cream industry 
And the third circumstance I'd like to mention that it is extremely important to enable approximation and uh, media sphere is the most important mechanism and instrument for our approximation. In, with, in this context, I'd like to say that uh, more than a year we have intensive cooperation between International Radio of China and Russian Radio Siberia Network. Part of this project is daily programs in Russian and in Chinese, in both Russia and China, especially in Siberia. In 2017, we, I mean my cooperation, joined to the Chinese initiative to create Asian mass media, and so we're a full-blown member, and we're the co-initiators of creation of such system. And in nearest days, early June, we'll start TV program together with Chinese. Chinese, it will be called BRICS TV. I hope very much that this is the first example of cooperation and media sphere that will have explosive cooperation, and it will serve for the further approximation uh, between the countries and the business community. Thank you very much. I will agree about ice cream and other consumer goods. I remember that our president was given an iPhone, and this had very big effect on audit, audit, uh, audience and demand for these telephones in Russia. You cannot build to power of Siberia, and it is difficult to present power of Siberia and pump too much product through the pipeline, also impossible. And this is what was mentioned by the colleagues in this segment that cannot be done. Are there any thoughts? So we, what we can improve? It seems that with all due respect to the scale of Russian economy and even Eurasian economy, expansion of Chinese entrepreneurs in Russia done by, according to the model that we see now, even if we imagine that in every region of Russia we have 10 oil refinery and uh, sawmills, will not impact the state of affairs in Chinese economy nor in Russian economy. We don't know how many jobs will be created in the Russian territory, whether we have more unemployed rather than employed people. This is a very important aspect. Not many people pay attention to it, but I'm not what I'm saying. We need to look at the opportunity to merge efforts of the Chinese entrepreneurs and Russian entrepreneurs so that we can create principally new products and models of operation on the global market. It seems that if we use this form and the format, if we can make up a formula, it will substantially improve the cooperation in both China and Russia because the chances to have substantial role of global market would truly have now we discuss only the question of in, inter, mutual penetration in slightly local scale. The Chinese slightly came to us. A bit of Russian came to China. They, they have progress. But it seems that the scale of the objective with both our countries is slightly different. And solving this problem is a joint exploration of the global world in the future. Thank you. I'd like to give the floor to Simonov Konstantin Vasilievich, Director General of the National Energy Security Fund. Thank you very much. I understand that um, the obstacle to going to lunch, and you speak about agriculture and ice cream, and we'll have lunch with ice cream. But still, I have to say a few words of appreciation. And this is to the organizers. And this is the third forum. And it occupies appropriate place in the Moscow arena. 
So thank you for this invitation. Actually, we see the mood of the members of the panel and the audience. Speaking about economic cooperation, we do have success. And Evgeny said, let's look at what is done. Of course, we can uh, have very positive presentation and tell about success in the energy area. And it's clear that I'll be talking about energy mostly. But everyone understands that considering the potential of Chinese economy and Russian economy and can be more substantial, including area of the fuel and energy complex. I don't want to cause hard feelings, but I don't see anything wrong with the fuel and energy as the flagship. In oil and gas, we can have much more rather than we have now. If there is necessity to report about success, we do have success. And we know that China today is the largest consumer of Russian oil, as the country I emphasize. And Russia is the largest country supplier of oil in China at the end of last year. If you read the news, we compete with Angola, but in terms of the last year, according to the customs statistics in China, last year the growth of supply of oil was 25%. The number is quite substantial. It's more than 50 million, quite uh, re reasonable volume in terms of the infrastructural projects. So the number had that seen. The total volume is more than 100 million. The achievements are quite substantial, and success is quite substantial. We build power of Siberia quite actively, <coughs> despite of doubts in Russian press from time to time. More than a third project is accomplished in terms of the linear part. We know that the contract, the floating contracts that allows May 19, May 20, we will manage this pipeline. We mentioned investments of China. I mean large participation in Yamal LNG, quite significant history. Chinese shareholders, Sibur is quite a similar story because Yamal LNG, Sibur is co-owner. However, the project of the Eastern Chemical Company, of course, it's a big story. Everything could be much better and much more serious. Look at the investment po point in the area of energy. Because of the Kizia, everyone talks about curators. Such a name doesn't tell you anything. What kind of curator, but number of the projects that he offered to Chinese didn't work out. We say that Chinese are afraid. Look at the Van Corp history story. And Sechen personally suggested Chinese uncall participation. President Putin was in favor. But really, it was a unique proposal because it amazed me. Because usually, we're looking for investment into greenfield when we talk about upstream. In order to invite into the realized project that is has ready infrastructure, just come, have revenue, have profits, considering what happened with the oil price decline. The project was extremely profitable, but Chinese didn't enter Encore. But Hindi, Indians entered. The next story, very large story we know all, is the sale of the 19 million shares of Rosneft. It's not a secret. Chinese had special requirements special role in decision-making, number of the seats on the board of directors, opportunity for veto right. As the result, we know that transaction was quite curious. We still have to sort out. Chinese are not there. And there are other entities, including European Bank. Although 
although in the 15th year, early 16th year, the variant of entrance of the Chinese company in the equity of Rosneft didn't happen. This requirement, in many ways, there was understanding that you have different complications. Without us, you will not sell to anyone. Give us special conditions, and then we will develop. This is also the question because the well, it is great when we talk about the economical background of our relationship, but the ongoing problem, the problem of trust towards each other related to the economics. It's not only politics, it's also economics. Desire, let's look at the sanctions. By the way, we have sanctions for three years. It was interesting story of uh, turn to east to China. It was ideal condition to improve cooperation, including in oil and gas complex. Yes, I'll say once again, we'll have success, but it could be much better. By what didn't happen, the question is, in my view, China perceived it as the success, opportunity they could earn because of the complications. They could take advantage. As for the loans, I know that um, many oil and gas companies, the oil companies had financial sanctions imposed. I know that many companies look towards China and they discovered that interest rate that China is ready to finance. It's much higher than the proposal of the Western banks and this surprised a number of the large players of the Russian market. Obviously, they expected that uh, they'll have a favorable regime. However, it didn't happen. A rather difficult negotiations about power of Siberia, the Altai pipeline, and there's pragmatic interest of China. They already have Middle Asian gas. They have certain price level the Chinese is looking at. It is clear that gas needs to be taken to the eastern coast. And not clear who will do it. This argument takes too much time. We'll see how we achieve compromise. I understand that from the side of the Chinese, Chinese colleagues may have some uh, claims, but if we want to move faster, we need to, in economical sphere, to have more tolerance towards each other, especially if we talk about the length of the cooperation. I can recall some other stories how the contracts with Rosneft was changed in terms of price and how China said that infrastructure is not quite prepared. We need to provide supplies through Cosmo considering the rate. Once again, I'm saying again, if Chinese colleagues are asked, they can uh, offer a list of claims that they have against us. So I think, I think that uh, the factor of certain distrust towards each other plays role in oil and gas. By the way, I'd like to mention at last the service as soon as the sanctions started. What were the expectations that the Chinese partners will have serious projects in the area of service business? It was super con successful point. Number of technical solutions were necessary for oil complex. Because of the sanctions, we expected that Western service companies can even depart from Russia to a panic mode, mood, such as what will happen to our service. And we thought that Chinese comrades will come to us. We remember oil and gas forum in spring. 15th year, huge number of the Chinese companies, 16th year, n huge number of Chinese companies. This year, much less. No large projects together, and we don't see, and the Western companies didn't leave Russian market out of service companies. So the question is, three years ago, we had a unique opportunity. 
Yes, I'm finishing. You didn't have to move along the stage. Unique opportunity to start at this point and create joint technologies. Now it is discovered that Western companies stay and the Chinese didn't come. And what will happen is not clear. So it's quite a banal thing in terms of the mutual trust. <clears throat> but it's still there. Because in China, they believe that we're too tricky. We believe that Chinese are too tricky. So this is our starting point. And we suspect each other, and it hinders us. Thank you very much. I have perhaps a simple question. At the end, uh, at the final point, we have plus or minus. What would you? What is your score about our relationships? Can we count what are the signs of tolerance towards each other? So perhaps two questions. The plus and minus. Why? Because once again, we have success and there are some impressive numbers. And we can report these impressive numbers, but it is so sorry that colossal potential we don't realize, even in oil and gas segment, things could have been much better. All right, colleagues, the questions from the audience. I remember my promise the institutes will work during the plenary session. Please give the floor to the second row. The colleagues stood up. Prepare to Mr. Kilzia. You will be given microphone. No question. Russia and China have interest towards mutual cooperation in economics and culture. It was mentioned here about the awareness. We need curator, organizer, sponsor, supervisor. And Alexander Nikolaevich said that we need guarantees. On our side, we need to provide opportunity for guarantees because most often from our side, we discover absence of opportunity to have guarantees. Who can provide from our side guarantees? Ministry of Economical Development, Deputy Ministry left. But in principle, it was obviously their role. More so, you said that the customs checkpoints are not well developed. Why not to use part of the customs duties and build checkpoints? Because it is necessary to have coordinate or curate. I don't know how to name properly should be present in our relationship with China. This is uh, essentially the form of a certain, a certain guarantee and curatorship for all the problems that we have in the area of the external foreign relationship with China. One of the solutions for the forum can be decision how to have organizational structure that could monitor the issues raised by this forum and the issues that can be initial point for the decision making. Thank you. It's not a question, it's rather a remark. So it's a question, who will be the curator? If colleagues want to, I'll give them opportunity to speak. I have a proposal. The most simple guarantee is you have money, such as insurance capital, that can be paid out to someone who suffers. We'll have two buckets, and we will uh, drop money there. That will be a fund, fund for guarantees between for Russian Chinese investment. At our level, is the most simple and realizable example. As it seems to me from our discussion, operationally is the only way. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm ready and I'm doing the provocative. Do any speakers have desire to seriously answer this question? No. I think that this is big compli com 
complication in our relationships. I don't think that in the framework of the conference we can easily find the question. If you need serious answer, in my understanding, there is no simple transition to easy scaling of our cooperation. And in given scale, at the level where it takes place, and the speakers express their opinion, so it may not be always profitable, not always efficient. So the problem is not easily to solve. I agree with Constantine. Even in oil and gas, we could have done much more, such as what if, Andrei Nikolaevich, do you have something to say? I, as former employee of Ministry of Economical Development, have different position. In my view, don't need guarantee. It's not what it is all about in any business. No, no one can guarantee that your business will work out well. As for what was stated now, uh, as far as I understand the fate of many projects, many things should change in thinking of Chinese businessmen. Because in many high-tech projects, with what I me uh, met, they were not ready to seriously invest and occupy a reasonable position. There are projects, I don't want to mention the projects, where we ourselves don't want to give all the keys and allow Chinese to make key decisions. It takes time, and we need serious interest when Chinese investors are ready to invest and learn to work according to the rules in Russia, such as we have experience of Germans and Japanese that they have more advanced experience, such as the high-speed rail, the localization of the rolling stock, the conditions they offered, and still often much more profitable compared to the Chinese proposals. So the question is a question of time and readiness to realize the projects. The pulp mills, the previous variants of partnerships such as Baikalski, the pulp mill, and other projects with co-investors and creditors that were not successful. If Chinese are ready to invest in Khabarovsk province, they discuss the project for, Kras for Krasnoyarsky province question of the conditions. For 25 years, we didn't build pipe, pulp mill. But it can be done, and there are projects that were realized in Bratsk with Japanese. I think it's normal competition of the projects. Thank you, colleagues. We have two, three minutes, and I see that there was someone else with question. I'm ready to allow one question. Hello. Much was spoken about the current state of Russian-Chinese relationship. The conference is called New Quality. What do you think? What is the breakthrough point when the quality things can be become quantity, become quality? I personally like the position of Ivan Viktorovich when he said that we need to together go to the global markets. Colleagues, are you ready? Who is ready to talk about uh, condition? I'd like to say, so nobody else but me, it's simple. I'd like to point out, Constantine abstained from the question, when we can have more tolerancy? If you noticed, it was my second question. Difficult, difficult to answer, because if you look, Maybe it's not the best topic to touch upon now. Not clearly cooperation in the area what China and Chinese investors can have in Pakistan. This example we should be studied in more detail, and we'll see whether we can efficiently at all cooperate with China. There we'll find the answer to the tolerancy question. It seems to me that many potential beneficiaries of investments in China, they'll look at what's happening in Pakistan. So look at the Pakistan, and they will know about tolerancy, but not now. Thank you very much. Session is closed.